Davis, and it's my pleasure to uh, welcome all of you uh, to uh, uh, one of our great annual events, the uh, uh, Thomas Fairchild Lecture, a lecture series put together by uh, the law clerks of uh, one of our most uh, esteemed and, as the last few minutes to test, beloved alums, Judge Tom Fairchild, and we're so delighted that uh, he could be with us today. Uh, it is usually the case that our annual Fairchild Lecture um, truly needs no introduction, uh, but more the case than ever this year because she herself uh, was a former clerk of the judge, uh, one of the organizers of this lecture series, and a regular participant uh, and attendee at these proceedings. So we're really uh, delighted and honored to have her back in, uh, uh, in this new capacity. Uh, judge uh, Joan Humphrey Lefko um, is a judge on the United States District Court for the Northern District of Illinois. And prior to her appointment, she was a U.S. bankruptcy judge in that district, and before that, a U.S. magistrate judge. Uh, she has her undergraduate degree from Wheaton College and a JD from uh, Northwestern School of Law, a school of law I've heard about down the road. Um, with all she's done, she still managed, what's that? Oh, excuse me. Uh, she still managed to uh, find time to be a speaker and panelist at many bar association uh, seminars uh, and an author of several law review articles. Um, and I think, um, I know you've got a printed program and I don't need to read it to you, but uh, just in case you don't make it to the bottom or your eyes are as bad as mine, I wanted to read the last sentence because uh, uh, it really touched me given some of the uh, recent personal struggles that the judge has endured. Um, at the end of her biography, she adds, uh, last but most important, Judge Lefko is the proud mother of four fabulous daughters who keep her on her best behavior most of the time. Um, <laughs> anyway, it's my honor to uh, um, introduce Judge Joan Lefko. If I speak louder, does that help? No? No. It's not a money loud. It's just I have to absorb it. All right. I'll try not to be. I, I learned from my kids to speak fast, but I'll <laughs> slow down a little. <laughs> anyway, I'll go on. A number of the previous lecturers have addressed issues pertaining to the work of the appellate courts the work that, of course, constituted the larger portion of Judge Fairchild's career. What I'll say today is going to be a bit more personal. I want to speak about the man, Thomas E. Fairchild, lawyer, politician, judge, mentor, and friend, through the lens of those of us who had the privilege of serving as his law clerks over the period from 1961 to 1994. 
I hope through my words to illustrate how this one man has affected the character and intellect of professors, deans, practicing lawyers, judges, politicians, and activists in a variety of communities. Based on what I know about the careers of these former law clerks, I have no doubt that they, and I hope myself included, have passed on his gifts as they interact with others within and without this noble profession of law. I'm going to start a ways back in time, and while we are reminded of a few milestones in his life and career, I believe some themes will emerge that inform my topic of Thomas E. Fairchild, A Judge's Legacy. Let me acknowledge some individuals who have made this presentation possible. First, the judge himself, who about 14 years ago, with the, with the uh, guidance of our wonderful circuit executive, Collins Fitzpatrick, where are you, Collins? Here. Oh, there you sit, back there. Gave an oral history over a period of several lengthy sessions. Collins', Collins is work in recording these oral histories of the Court of Appeals judges has been an invaluable contribution to the nation and to our courts. I also want to acknowledge all the former law clerks who sent me their recollections and thoughts, which I have used liberally. And finally, I'm indebted to this young woman on my right, Jordan Russell, who helped me a great deal with the research and drafting. Jordan's a student at the Kent College of Law in Chicago, and along with this young man on my left, Jed Rohrer, who's a student here at the University of Wisconsin Law School, they will be my helpers today. As we weave in and out of this tale, you will hear the voice of the judge through Jed, and Jordan will normally speak for the law clerks. Back and, uh, there will be a few back and forth instances, however, where Jed changes voices, and I trust that that will be apparent in context. <laughs> <laughs> that is, the, char the person that he's speaking, not his voice. <laughs> and at the same time, I hope you, Judge, can hear me. <laughs> and that this walk down memory lane will be fun for you. Although his life has been one of utter rectitude as far as I know, there are a few shocking events. <laughs> such as, at the age of 12, young Tommy Fairchild could be found running campaign tables for Coolidge and Dawes on the front lawn of the family home in Milwaukee. <laughs> in 1932, at the age of 20, he was a member of the Princeton Young Republicans, playing in a makeshift band and making speeches for Hoover out of the back of a truck. <laughs> Not that there was anything wrong with it. <laughs> but we know that at some point, Tom Fairchild began to change direction politically, likely during the Depression. In 1934, he entered law school. You students will be interested to know that the tuition at this law school, when our judge enrolled in 1934, was $37.50 a semester. <laughs> I have begun to feel that the power of government ought to be used for broader purposes in helping solve problems. The New Deal had something to do with convincing me of that. And the, and the La Follette Progressive Movement split off from the Republican Party and started a new party in Wisconsin in 1934. So there was a separate progressive party at that time. And I wound up going in that direction. While at the university, Tom met Eleanor Dahl, the woman whom we would all come to respect and admire for her intelligence, charm, dignity, and warm embrace of each of the clerks as a member of the Fairchild extended family. On one occasion, I just happened to look into the YWCA office and saw a very handsome young lady sitting at the desk there and was quite impressed. And things were done a little differently in those days. I didn't just barge in and say, hi. I hunted up a friend of mine in law school who I knew had been president of the student YMCA and I discovered that he had met this lady and knew her name. I got his permission to go in and introduce myself. And on the strength of that, I went in and said hello. And that blossomed into a friendship, etc. And then ultimately, we got married. 
Tom and Eleanor were married in July 1937 at Eleanor's childhood home in Indiana. They would have four children whom we know as Tim, Susan, Jenny, and Andy. Colleen Reinke. The lessons I learned from Eleanor Fairchild were just as valuable as those I learned from the judge. Lesson one, cocktail hour is vitally important. <laughs> my, my first introduction to the idea of cocktail hour was with the Fairchilds. There were reasons that cocktail hour was important, and it wasn't so much the cocktails as the company. It was a chance to settle down at the end of the day and talk. These days, most folks just don't do that. When you have cocktail hour, you have no choice. You can't sit with a drink in your hand and mope in the corner. You have to talk to folks. You tell stories. You recap the day's events. You discuss the happenings of the city, state, the country, and the world. You solve problems and laugh. You enjoy each other's company. This is the way connections are made, and it is an art that should not be lost. Eleanor was pointing out a new way to be. Upon graduation from law school in 1937, Tom Fairchild clerked for his father, Edward T. Fairchild, then a Wisconsin Supreme Court Justice. Before his clerking term expired, however, his father urged him to take a position with a small private firm of Grady, Farnsworth, and Walker in Portage. The point of my dad's insistence that I ought to get that job, if at all possible, was his regard for Dan Grady, who had been a lawyer of great prominence and ability. He had a very, very resilient mental attitude toward the law. He would be able to think up things that a lot of lawyers would never think of. Anne Fisher. It was the Milwaukee Road bankruptcy case, Milwaukee Road 2 to be exact. I still remember the morning early in my second year of clerking when the judge came into my office to tell me the analysis that had come to him while he was shaving that morning. He beamed. He gestured at the map of the line. He was proud. He was excited. And not incidentally, of course, he was right. I think it was in that moment that it all came together. There was something beyond facts and the law, beyond substance and procedure. There was the law with a capital L. The, wa the walker of Grady, Farnsworth, and Walker was Dorothy Walker. The judge described her as very capable in general practice and an excellent trial lawyer. Janet Lindgren. Joan Humphrey and I were the judge's first woman clerks. The judge simply, persistently, and consistently refused to sacrifice us to stereotypes about women. When he introduced us at social events to members of the Milwaukee Bar, we soon learned to anticipate the common comment, clerks are getting better looking. <laughs> Each and every time, with a completely straight face and an eyebrow arch, the Judge Fairchild would simply say, Smarter, too. <laughs> After a few years at the firm, however, he wanted to try his wings at something bigger, he said. He left private practice in 1941 and went into government service at the Office of Price Administration in Chicago. The War Powers Act gave the President power to allocate scarce commodities. And on that phrase, the whole consumer rationing system was built. Rationing of tires, new automobiles, sugar, typewriters, gasoline, shoes, ultimately canned goods, butter, and meat. All built on that phrase, allocate scarce commodities. In 1945, he went back into private practice at Miller, Mack, and Fairchild, no relation, in Milwaukee, the firm now known as Foley and Lardner where he remained until 1948, drawing up pension and profit sharing plans, corporate financing, and the like. I never could get a real big kick out of splitting stock. <laughs> Fairchild, I, I hate to call him Fairchild, Mr. Fairchild, whatever. <laughs> remained a progressive until the party folded in 1946 when Senator Bob La Follette, son of the great Robert M. La Follette Sr., was defeated. After that, Tom Fairchild didn't feel that much allegiance to anything, he said. When Jim Doyle, a friend and former classmate at the university, called to ask him to be a part of the 1948 Democratic campaign, he responded, Why, Jim, I don't even know I'm a Democrat. 
The idea behind the 1948 Democratic campaign was to build the organization by att attracting ex-progressives and fielding a good ticket. Feeling honored that he had been asked to be part of a quality ticket, Tom Fairchild agreed to run, though neither he nor Doyle thought the Democrats had a chance to win. In fact, on the phone, Doyle had told him that everybody knew Truman couldn't win and none of us would. <laughs> yes, the president that I saw the most was President Truman. The very first time was in the campaign of 48. I was running for attorney general and he was running for president. And the common wisdom of the day was that he didn't have the chance of the proverbial snowball. And then I was told that if I could get myself and my wife up to Sparta, Wisconsin, I could get on the presidential campaign train. He reports that a couple of very nice ladies volunteered to take them and their son, Tim, to Sparta that morning, and they were permitted to board the train with the President and Mrs. Truman. And it was a quite revealing sort of observation that we were able to make. This is through rural territory coming down from Sparta, and at almost all highway crossings, there would be people out there to see this train go through. And it began to look as if maybe people thought a little bit more about this man than we had, than we had been led to believe. We came down to Madison in the early afternoon, went out to the stock pavilion, and the crowd, people hanging off the rafters, practically. Well, everybody knows that Truman did win the 1948 election, as did Tom Fairchild. What had begun as a largely symbolic campaign had turned into an overwhelming victory. Not only was Tom Fairchild the only candidate to win on any in the, or win on the Democratic ticket, he received more than 622,000 votes, the highest number of votes of any, Demo any Democrat had ever received in Wisconsin for a state office. This was quite a showing for a fledgling politician, especially considering he had only been able to campaign on evenings and weekends because of his job at Miller Mac. With characteristic humility, Fairchild would maintain it was a lucky win. <laughs> Tom Fairchild was an active and successful attorney general. He, start, he started an antitrust investigation into tobacco growers' practices, worked to uphold the constitutionality of statewide primaries in Supreme Court elections, and he dived into de facto segregation of the public swimming pools in Beloit. In some cases, he was perhaps too successful and too straight-laced for his own good. An opinion came out that yes, indeed, a TV show called Stop the Music was illegal. The opinion came out right in the middle of my 1950 campaign for the Senate, and I never saw anything like that. You know, I'd been issuing opinions, and a lot of people didn't know anything about them. But the day that opinion came out, I couldn't walk into a store without someone saying, oh, you're the Attorney General. You got out that goddamn opinion that says we can't watch that show. <laughs> oh, it was vicious. I lost a lot of votes, I'm sure, just on that. Although he received 47% of the vote in the general election, Fairchild ultimately lost to Republican Alexander Wiley. Soon after his defeat, President Truman appointed him the United States Attorney for the Western District of Wisconsin. Unlike today, when the federal prosecutors spend a great deal of time on drug trafficking, in that era, federal criminals wore the, white, wore the white collar. One of his memorable cases involved the indictment of a married couple for perjury during bankruptcy proceedings. The presiding judge said of the United States Attorney's performance, as to the prosecution, the court believes probably the ablest job that this court has ever experienced has been presented here by Mr. Fairchild. If, if Fairchild had to be convinced to run for the Senate in 1950, the decision to enter the 1952 race was born of the conviction that the communist baiting tactics of junior Senator Joseph R. McCarthy the memory of whom was recently revived by the movie Good Night and Good Luck, had to be defeated. Tom Fairchild resigned as United States Attorney and began to campaign. We had to make the best shot we could. I had no money. If I had felt easy in my conscience about it, I would just as soon not have run. 
But I became convinced that because of my run for attorney general, which had been successful, and my run for the Senate, which had not, and other factors in terms of my relationships with leaders around the state, that I could do better than Henry Royce was doing. David Walter. In 1952, I was a young 16-year-old taking my first interest in politics. I was revolted by Joe McCarthy. Very few people today remember what a dangerous, vicious, and powerful person he was. In 1952, Tom Fairchild put his career on the line and took on Joe McCarthy. I worked in Tom's campaign. He gave us something to be proud of. In the primary, Fairchild garnered a modest 97,321 votes. McCarthy had won 515,481 votes. Despite McCarthy's overwhelming numbers, Fairchild maintained that he had a very good fighting chance to beat the junior senator. The Democratic hope was that McCarthy's landslide primary victory would be overcome if Fairchild could acquire the votes of both parties losing primary candidates as well as a substantial number of those voters who hadn't gone to the polls in the primary. While McCarthy had access to virtually unlimited campaign funds, Fairchild's campaign had been among one of the most poorly financed in the history of Wisconsin Senate races. As the Milwaukee Journal noted of the candidate, he pays more for the rent of a loudspeaker on his car than for rent on his two-room political headquarters. He stoops to retrieve political literature discarded by his sidewalk listeners. <laughs> in late October of 1952, less than a month away from the general election, the Fairchild camp was still struggling financially and had quite a bit of trouble coming up with the money to send out 500,000 postcards. Also problematic was Fairchild's serious and mild-mannered temperament, which critics claim could not command the requisite crowd appeal for a successful candidate. On the campaign trail, his waving from an open car was described as jerky and cautious, as if he feared <laughs> that bystanders really did not want him to wave at them. <laughs> And at a fall speaking event, his serious, studious talk, purportedly, failed to match the holiday spirit of the crowd. Fairchild was thought to inspire respect, but little enthusiasm. Eleanor. Tom, you'll never be a politician worth your salt unless you learn to work a room. <laughs> Despite the financial, practical, and stylistic handicaps his campaign faced, Fairchild did receive significant political support. A Fairchild President Truman said he had impressed him as a very able and decent citizen whom any Democrat could enthusiastically support for Senate. Democratic presidential candidate Adlai Stevenson spoke of Fairchild's record for bringing to public office the highest ideals of decency, dignity, and clean government. Perhaps the most significant source of support for the Democratic candidate was from the press. The Milwaukee Journal wrote favorably of Mr. Fairchild throughout the campaign. At times, the journal's pro-Fairchild bias was so clear, its readers were prompted to question its journalistic integrity in response to pictures of the two Senate candidates published soon after the primary, a Colonel Block of Milwaukee wrote to the journal. Let me inquire where you resurrected that picture of Senator McCarthy, which appeared next to a very flattering picture of Fairchild. You have evidently taken great pains to show Fairchild as a glamour boy, whereas, <laughs> whereas McCarthy looks like he was a candidate for Skid Row. Is that the best you can do? You can get away with a lot of liberalism if you dress conservatively. <laughs> the best explanation for Fairchild's success in the general election was ultimately his own straightforward and earnest campaign. Refusing to focus only on McCarthyism, Fairchild instead promised that his campaign would be largely concentrated on what I, myself, as a candidate stand for and what the people can expect from me. In addition to posi positions on specific issues, Fairchild's campaign platform evidenced his belief 
that the United States should rely on its tradition of respect for individual rights and democratic ideals to lead the world in the fight against communism, not by force, but by example. At the time, the idea that Fairchild could defeat McCarthy seemed to be considerably far-fetched. In retrospect, in retrospect, it was not that far off the mark. The general election returns <coughs> proved that Fairchild had clung tenaciously to the senator's heels. McCarthy received about 420,000 votes and Fairchild about 300,000. McCarthy had indeed won the election, but with fewer votes than he received in the primary and fewer than any other winner on the Republican ticket. Fairchild, on the other hand, received three times as many votes in the general election than he had in the primary. After losing the 1952 election, Tom Fairchild would not again campaign for political office. Matt Flynn. The judge always spoke longingly of his political days, his race against Joe McCarthy, etc. He handed out campaign pins of the McCarthy race to us. In 1978, I was the Democratic nominee for Congress in the 9th Congressional District of Wisconsin. I beat three other opponents for the right to take on Jim Sensenbrenner in what was also his first race for Congress. He won the general election. It was an overwhelmingly Republican seat. The day after I won the primary, the phone rang about 7 a.m. It was Judge Fairchild. He congratulated me and had many questions about the upcoming race. Mary, who was not too keen on my running in the first place, grabbed the phone from me and said, I think you bit him. <laughs> the judge loved that and repeated it many times. He is a great judge, but there is no doubt in my mind that he would have enjoyed as much or more being a senator or higher. Mike Zimmer. It seems incredible that Tom Fairchild and his small band of progressive Democrats could resuscitate the party and take over the state. But they did, through their high energy, purpose, and talent. Despite stiff odds, their sense of mission trumped momentum, and they had a lot of fun while doing great work. Looking back now at what he and his colleagues did, I wonder why we, the people in my generation, seem to have done so little to keep that progressive movement going in the right direction. He returned to private practice in Milwaukee with his friend Irv Charney in the law firm Fairchild, Charney & Cops. They were nice enough to let me put my name first. <laughs> Along with his law firm work, Tom Fairchild worked with the Milwaukee Bar Association to develop a list of 15 or 20 attorneys, including himself, who would be willing to and did represent individuals called before the House Un-American Activities Committee. Four years later, However, he ran successfully for the Wisconsin State Supreme Court, thus beginning his judicial career. I must say, I wondered whether anyone would use my appearance before HUAC against me, and two judicial campaigns were to follow, but I am not aware that anyone ever tried. David Walter. In 1960, the Wisconsin legislature, for the first time, established law clerks for the Supreme Court justices. I was first in my class at Marquette Law School and knew I'd be eligible for consideration. In fact, I wanted no other job and wanted to work for no other justice than Judge Fairchild. I took the bus to Madison October 31st, 1960. I remember the date because it was my birthday, 24 years old. I interviewed with the judge and it's my recollection that he gave me an offer which I accepted on the spot. I think I was the first Wisconsin Supreme Court law clerk to be hired. The initial legal training I received from him has given me an objectivity that has served me well in court. However, more important, the courage of principle he showed in putting his career on the line in challenging Joe McCarthy has provided a personal and political model for me that has sustained me through some pretty troublesome political times. Asked in 1992 to speak of the Wisconsin Supreme Court cases, he thought were most significant, Judge Fairchild recalled by name and citation, Ross versus Ebert, 275 Wisconsin 523. In that case, the applications for membership of two black men who wished to join the Masons and Bricklayers Labor Union had been ignored by the defendant union officers. The applicants filed a suit to compel the union to accept them as members. 
The trial court dismissed the complaint for lack of jurisdiction and failure to state a cause of action. Supreme Court affirmed the judgment. The court reasoned that jurisdiction was lacking because although the Constitution had been interpreted consistently to provide a remedy for invasion of a legal right, membership in a voluntary association was a privilege, not a right. Furthermore, the legislature had not declared racial discrimination in employment to be illegal, but only undesirable. And if a right, the remedy was through the good offices of the Industrial Commission, which could investigate and give publicity to its findings. Addressing the argument that the 14th Amendment authorized the court's intervention, the court reasoned that because only discrimination by state action is within its contemplation, and the union's conduct had been wholly private, plaintiffs were entitled to no relief. Justice Fairchild dissented. First sentence. The crucial question is whether members of a union are the sole arbiters of those with whom they desire to associate, and can exclude applicants against whom the members have no grievance, except that the applicants belong to a different race or creed. Michael Zimmer. <clears throat> Reading a Fairchild opinion is a joy. The words just leap off the page in perfect order. Each word is exactly the right one. No extra words interrupt the logical flow or cloud the meaning. The judge's writing looks so effortless that he might be called the Mozart of legal, legal writing. <laughs> Some may write in the apparently effortless way Mozart composed music, but perhaps a better analogy for the judge is Beethoven. The judge's writing appears effortless, but instead, it is the product of his hard work. On the issue of state action, Justice Fairchild invoked the 1948 decision of the United States Supreme Court in Shelley versus Kramer, which held that a court's enforcement of a racially restrictive covenant was state action and in violation of the Equal Protection Clause. Starting with the broad proposition, in addition to political equality, the full availability to everyone of education and full opportunity for employment to the extent of his capacity are generally considered the basic essentials in order to erase from America anything which could be termed second-class citizenship. Parenthetically, I note that no authority is cited for this proposition, as one would likely find in any current opinion drafted by law clerks, as most are. He called this the majestic imperative. <laughs> And on the issue of state action, he reasoned that the state legislature had enacted the Employment Peace Act, which had the purpose and effect of protecting the employees in matters of organizing. Under the 14th Amendment, the state must not deny to any person the equal protection of the laws. Under Shelley, a state may not enforce a private contract that excludes persons because of race. Therefore, it follows that if a union has a constitution, that restricts membership based on race, the court cannot enforce that restriction, or stated otherwise, to do so would deny the applicants the equal protection of the laws. Janet Lindgren. I still can't speak French, but Judge Fairchild taught me how to speak cases. To this day, I speak them with a Fairchild accent and syntax. I remember the basic rules in his chambers as being quite simple, and they made all the difference. Number one, case names belong in sentences, not after them. So placed, you have to say something about them or with them. We learned that the job was the doing, the making, the explaining. Number two, hold on to the few cases that actually help get you to a decision and push the rest off the table. If you leave them to clutter the table and then the page, neither you nor your reader will easily find what you have to say. Number three, don't bother trying to hide behind cases, especially now that you only have a few left. <laughs> the judge's dissent prompted the following response from Washington. Dear Mr. Justice Fairchild, it's dated June 28, 1957. Thank you very much for your letter of the 25th, enclosing a copy of your dissent in the case of Randolph Ross versus Charles Ebert. It gave me quite a lift, for I am very happy that there still are people in this great United States who believe in the rights of the individual and work for his welfare. As you know from long experience, when certain organizations become powerful, they do things they otherwise would never have done under any circumstances. It is often the case that when the underdog gets on top, 
He's a darn sight meaner than his predecessor ever was. Your thoughtfulness in sending me your dissent in this affair is highly appreciated. Sincerely yours, Harry Truman. Although the justice was a dissenter, his position was vindicated when the legislature enacted a law against dis <coughs> discrimination by labor unions. <clears throat> Although victorious in a second term election, his career on the Supreme Court was soon to come to an end. Time constrains my telling you about the court's role in permitting needed changes in the torts field, such as abrogation of various, various immunity defenses, the court's insistence on reapportionment in the face of the legislature's stubborn resistance, and the sunbursting principle. Let it be said that Judge Fairchild is widely recognized as a great <coughs> common law judge, as his longstanding membership in the American Law Institute also reflects. We must move on. In 1966, President Johnson nominated Tom Fairchild to the United States Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. During the first of those years, the judges' chambers were located in the striking Romanesque structure built about 1900 as Milwaukee's post office court and customs house. As Judge Joe Stadmuller described it, one who enters the building from Wisconsin Avenue walks into an expansive five-story central atrium surrounded by wide corridors and capped with massive arched steel roof trusses covered with a glass skylight. If one walks up to the fourth floor, the eyes feast on inlaid multicolored marble mosaics, raised panel oak doors and jams, and decorative plastered ceilings. Tucked along the south wall across the hall from District Judge John Reynolds were two modest rooms assigned to Judge Fairchild for his chambers, one for him and the other partitioned for his secretary and law clerks. Next door was a musty law library which housed all the books available to us beyond those lining the walls of chambers. Yes, we actually took those books off the shelves, opened them, and read the cases. <laughs> The judge sat in his office, and after reading his mail and exchanging morning pleasantries with his staff, he went to his table and began to work. Mike Zimmer. He engaged in a bit of ritual in writing opinions. He always wrote with blue ink on an eight and a half by 11 legal pad of white paper. Each page had its tipping point. The judge would write and scratch out write and scratch out until his aesthetic sense was offended by the cumulative effect of the scratch outs. <laughs> Starting anew with what he liked, he would ball up the old page and take a shot. Difficult cases meant mounds of near misses around the wastebasket. His end product says so much at such a deep level. His opinions fit in the larger structure of the law. Yes, yet his writing is clear, forceful, and efficient. I have tried to emulate the judge in my own writing and to impart the lessons I learned to my students. The comparison remains daunting, though I still use white legal pads and blue ink. <laughs> Martha Olson. The writing itself, done in longhand, drafts given to Shirley Newsom, the judge gently asking how it was going, ever mindful of the famous backlog. The return drafts with split infinitives neatly circled and the judge remarking, I'm a bit old fashioned when it comes to grammar. Bill Conley. Even now, 20 years later, I am unable to write that an opponent's reliance on an opinion is misplaced. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> Every once in a while, I, correcting a law clerk's draft, run into a split infinitive or different than instead of different from and things of that sort. And I will put a little note on there saying, you never met Mary Kay Howe, but she wouldn't stand for that. <laughs> Mary Howe was an English teacher that I had had three years out of the four in high school, and she really had an effect on us. John Skilton. I think it is timely to reflect on what good appellate decision making is all about. Although, as we all know, Judge Fairchild was a committed Democrat on social issues, he left his politics at the door. His decisions were characterized by, and slowed down by, the drudgery of his personal efforts. He studied case law, he read the record, he stewed over nuances, he cared about the facts, 
The final product was his own and fully reflected the thought and care that had gone into it. His opinions were constrained by the record. They were short, crisp, and directed solely at the issues that had to be addressed and resolved in order to dispose of the appeal. No humor, no fluff, no hyperbole, no dicta, and no shots at attorneys. Stopping mo momentarily on shots at attorneys, here are the words of three other Seventh Circuit judges. Example A. No argument based on Wisconsin law has been preserved, so this appeal was doomed. Because he took his cue from the newspapers rather than from the law books, plaintiff's lawyer, yes, he has one, neglected to notice. <laughs> Example B. In what must be one of the most amazing lines ever set out in a brief, defendant's attorneys ask, would Mr. Starr be able to search the Oval Office without a search warrant? We are dumbstruck by this comparison, made as it is on behalf of a public official charged with keeping records. If defendant himself approves of the question asked, perhaps that explains how he got into his present predicament. Example C. Because the argument that plaintiff collection agency ratified the fraud when instituting this litigation is totally without merit and so ridiculous, we refuse to waste any more time in this opinion discussing the matter raised. <laughs> Bill Conley. If there was one rule about opinion writing that I would attribute to Judge Fairchild, it would be to address the facts and issues presented in the case fairly, rule clearly, and state your reasons. No less, no more. A number of sub-rules followed. First, say it once and say it well. The second sub-rule is that words matter. The third sub-rule may be the most important. Decide no more than the issues presented. A fourth sub-rule is similarly important. Do not engage in any uncivil comments about the parties, their circumstances, the legal system, or fellow judges. The judge has no trouble writing forcefully and persuasively, but always with civility, taking care to reflect his appreciation of the human condition and the unfortunate circumstances in which humans can find themselves. Hildy Neubauer. He never loses sight of the people behind the legal arguments and the real life consequences of the decisions being made. Every case, no matter how seemingly trivial, receives his complete and careful attention. From an issue affecting the rights of hundreds of citizens or a multi-billion dollar corporation to an individual social security disability benefits appeal. During 1971-72, when Janet and I were clerks, by the happenstance of the indictment of Otto Kerner, who was a judge on the Seventh Circuit, the judge was assigned, along with judges Wilbur Pell and Walter Cummings, to the appeal of the Chicago 7 trial known in the case books as United States versus Dellinger, centering on the events surrounding the 1968 Democratic Convention. The defendants were charged under, under the Anti-Riot Act of 1968. Much was at stake. It was a big case in terms of public interest. It was a big case in terms of the kind of law and order support that had been voiced for the rulings and positions of Judge Julius Hoffman in the trial of the case. It cut to the heart of a lot of the feelings of the late 60s and early 70s in terms of opposition to the Vietnam War. The trial record was 22,000 pages. Judge Fairchild read it, page after page, day after day, week after week, until he finished. Janet Lindgren. It takes longer to write an opinion when you take the record seriously. <laughs> <laughs> We fast forward 20 years for a good story. This is after the judge returned to Madison as a senior judge. Sandra Miller leads. It was the fall of 1992. The judge and I had just returned from my first oral argument in Chicago. The first case we had heard was what appeared to be a relatively straightforward criminal case. Prior to oral arguments, we had read through the briefs and drew our preliminary conclusions to confirm the conviction. The judge okayed my offer to begin drafting the opinion. He informed me that, upon his return from lunch, which began with a hearty walk around the Capitol, followed by a bowl of soup at Miller's Market and one bag of oyster crackers, he would begin reading the record. The record? 
You mean the 10 boxes sitting in the corner of your office? I have to admit, I was somewhat skeptical that a man who had been on the bench for as long as I had been alive, 26 years at that point, had the patience to read through 10 boxes of testimony, exhibits, and objections. I mean, that was the clerk's job, right? But I smiled, nodded, and told him to enjoy his lunch. Later that afternoon, I peeked in on him, and sure enough, to his word, he was halfway through the first box. Tuesday, I had three pages of the opinion written, brief spread out over my desk, F subs and F seconds spread out all over the floor. The judge was on box two, boxes two through five of the record, with stacks of the record spread out over his desk, boxes spread out all over his floor. For lunch, he took a vigorous walk around the Capitol and had soup and crackers at Miller's Market. I was beginning to suspect a pattern emerging. <laughs> Wednesday, I continued to lose myself in writing the opinion. The judge, with the passion, concentration, and energy, as, through this was, as though this was his first case as a judge, continued to scrub through page after page of the record. But there was something different today. The judge took a brisk walk around the university and had the soup of the day at Ella's Deli and a bagel. <laughs> I thought he had broken his routine. But what I soon came to learn was that the Wednesday soup of the day at Ella's was all part of his master plan. <laughs> Thursday, I continued to bury myself in what, at this point, I thought was the most brilliant, well thought out opinion in the history of the judicial system. <laughs> I knew I loved this job. At this point, I was daydreaming about seeing my opinion in the reporter. <laughs> for those of you who have clerked for the judge, I'm sure you are chuckling because you know that the judge will certainly cut the draft down by a third and rewrite substantial portions of that as well. Near the end of the day, however, the judge stood in front of my office door, gave me that little smile with one eyebrow raised, as he so often does, and asked me a very simple question. I sat and thought about his question for a moment. I turned to my computer. I hit delete all. <laughs> Friday, I began writing the opinion again, <laughs> this time for a reversal, and at noon, we went together to Miller's for soup. <laughs> this meticulousness was put to the test in Dellinger. I took a diary of 1968. There were some significant parts of the record which related to preliminary trips that had been made out here by some of the defendants, and consultations with the city about parade permits and things of that sort. As I went through the transcript, I would note in my diary page references, or a little notation on something that happened. I finally wound up with a comprehensive narrative statement of facts, which I think was reasonably fair. Amazingly, the summary of the facts consists of but six pages in the Fed Second Reporter. As Judge Fairchild set it out in the opinion, the government contended that each defendant shared the common aim of producing violence during convention week in Chicago under circumstances where it would seem that the violence had been precipitated by the establishment and appear that the government was forced to destroy its own people in the streets in order to survive. Although that was the real purpose defendants allegedly had in mind, it was a purpose they could not afford to announce. The defendants contended that defendants' apparent intent to demonstrate to march, to organize peaceful activity, and to hold a contrasting festival of life was their real intent. That it is ludicrous to believe that this was all a facade for the plan attributed to them by the government. The talented lawyers on either side of the appeal were equally fervent and entrenched. Janet Lindgren. Judge Fairchild taught me how important it is to try to look at things from another perspective than the one that comes naturally. I think of the day Judge Fairchild appeared at my desk with one of the many volumes of the Chicago 7 transcript. It says here, he showed me, that the motto of the yippies was, beware the creeping meatball. What, he asked, does that mean? <laughs> the judge had not dismissed the motto or the yippies out of hand. He was prepared to try to understand these strange birds. Steve Seliger. When he approached the case, he listened carefully to both sides. 
He believed that government had a role in containing violence, no matter what the grievances that motivated the defendants. But he also gave legitimacy to the grievances and the grievance. He somehow was able to get to the root of things, even though it meant decisively ruling against one side or the other, and still leave them with respect. Being a would-be lefty in the early 70s, I believe certain people were evil and others good. Judge Fairchild did not ascribe such value judgments to people. He believed them all good in their essence. This was a great lesson he taught me. Ultimately, relieving, revealing perhaps a slight reservation through his extraordinary use of a double negative, he wrote, we conclude that when the statute is fairly read as a whole and all basic relations between its elements are noted, the statute is not unconstitutional. <laughs> Jim Clink. When I read the Dellinger case, I knew I wanted to be his law clerk. Idealist, idealistic young lawyers always want to be engaged in the issues of their day. And the Vietnam War protests at the 1968 Democratic National Convention were emblematic of the time. But the more profound impact of the Dellinger opinion on me was the fundamental sense of fairness, balance, and care the opinion displayed. While he may well have viewed the Anti-Riot Act of 1968 as an unfortunate law, he respected the role of Congress in a careful parsing of an inartful statute to uphold its validity. His painstaking review of the evidence, likewise, gave proper deference to the role of the jury. But he drew the line when Judge Hoffman and the prosecuting attorneys engaged in misconduct to deny the defendants their right to a fair trial. In 1975, Judge Fairchild became the chief judge of the Court of Appeals. This meant the Fairchild had to leave their Wisconsin home and move to Chicago. Despite the inconvenience for the family, the law clerks benefited. Nils Olson. I will always remember the first two months of my clerkship as a very special time. My wife was studying in Europe on a fellowship, and Mrs. Fairchild was in Milwaukee, working to make the difficult move to Chicago that was demanded by his new title of chief judge. As a result, we worked late nearly every night, more often than not walked over to Burghoff's to close the gentleman's bar, as it was then known, had dinner and walked home. We both lived on the near north side. This was an opportunity to get to know the judge personally and well, and to revel in his wonderful collections of recollections of rebuilding the Democratic Party in Wisconsin, one that prior clerks undoubtedly had on their many trips between Milwaukee and Chicago for oral arguments. Bill Conley. I well remember the first day of my clerkship, arriving in an ill-fitting blue will pinstripe suit on a hot early September day and being greeted by the judge's secretary, Shirley Newsom, a poised, professional, and well-spoken woman who left no doubt as to the chain of command. <laughs> <laughs> Which was the judge, the secretary, and then the law clerks. <laughs> and there were more cases, many more cases. Jim Clink. My first month on the job saw a petition for an on-bank review in the metropolitan-wide remedy aspect of the Gautreau Scattersite housing litigation in Chicago. The year ended with the Arlington Heights exclusionary zoning case that went to the Supreme Court. Throughout the year, in the cases and in chambers, equal opportunity and inclusion were the rule of decision. Martha Olson. 25 years on, the cases blur and merge. A long opinion affirming the conviction of an Illinois Attorney General, a dissent in an antitrust case, orders of new trials in several criminal cases, employment cases and product liability cases, the range of problems that make their way onto the federal appellate docket. What remains are the clear images of the judge, tall and distinguished in a navy blue suit, gathering his clerks around the coffee table in his chambers to review the cases to be argued. We all learn from Judge Fairchild. I learned that wearing a suit shows respect for what I do. I learned as much about how to be a good person as I learned how to be the best lawyer that I could be from the judge. I learned from him that true humility comes from the recognition of the basic humanity of every person, no matter her education, station, or status. I make a special effort to attend the ALI annual meetings and periodic gatherings of the various consultative groups because that is what Judge Fairchild would have expected me to do. I learned that no matter what happens in life, 
It goes on. You can be sad for a while, but you can't be sad forever. Losses in life come, and you are far better off if you just understand and accept that. He taught me that one can find peace and beauty in life's simple routines. I close with the following statement from Janet. I remember Judge Fairchild telling us how surprising it is, years after you have written a difficult and delicate opinion, to have a lawyer hand your words back to you. Did I really say that? <laughs> Do you think the judge will look at all we have written about what we learned from him and wonder, did I really do that? <laughs> yes, Judge Fairchild, you did. <laughs> Thank you very much. so creative and just uh, very moving. Uh, the judge knows what happens next. Maybe some of uh, her guests don't. Uh, this uh, attractive little devil is the symbol of our law school. We call it the gargoyle, and uh, hopefully you can stay for the reception and uh, see the real thing out there uh, toward, the, toward the driveway. But uh, judge, uh, I know you've envied this for a long time. <laughs> Thank you so much Thank for being you. this year's great job. the law clerks who are here, who came to be here, and not only those who made these contributions, but please stand so everyone can see who you are. <laughs>